Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for coming. It's always nice to be here, and I'd like to start out by thanking the organizers and the conference for me. Uh, this is my second time in Russia, and I always enjoy it here. It's a really re refreshing experience in many ways. Um, today I'm going to talk about an area of research uh, that I've been working on for about 10 or 15 years. Uh, it has various names, sometimes self-healing systems, sometimes autonomic computing, sometimes self-adaptive systems. And during this 10 years, it's grown from what was an interesting idea uh, that several researchers had into what I would say now is actually starting to become mainstream as a focus uh, for systems design. So I'm going to talk a bit about my system uh, that we've built at Carnegie Mellon uh, to give you one instance of a particular approach to uh, this idea of self-healing, uh, and then uh, talk about some of the newer work that we're doing. How do we advance the, the talk? Uh, well, <clears throat> at some point, we'll have the next slide. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the vision of self-healing systems. What's the motivation, and why does it represent something uh, perhaps a little different in terms of how we think about the system? Um, but then I'm going to try to explain, in fact, uh, we do this today, but perhaps not in the most systematic way. And that as a, uh, for a field such as software engineering, and particularly for researchers, we need to find a way to make this kind of capability available uh, to anyone, not just specialized applications. Um, in order to explain uh, at a concrete level what this means, I'm going to talk about our own system. It's called Rainbow. And I'm going to give a few uh, ideas about how you can apply this to the area of security. It's an area where self-adaptation is particularly important. And then I'll talk about a couple research directions. Both of these, I think, are um, almost ready for uh, real-time, uh, prime-time, uh, software development um, in industry. Okay, so what's the problem? Uh, today we know that so many systems um, depend on high availability for success. If the systems go down um, for any length of time, um, they won't be used. And this is becoming particularly challenging, uh, increasingly challenging, because uh, we have to build systems in, on top of other systems which may fail. In addition, of course, our systems may fail. But we also have to deal with widely different environments. For example, uh, high loads at certain peak periods, low loads at others. And also external influences and internal, such as attacks, uh, insider attacks, the denial of service attacks, and so on. So availability um, is, much, is a much harder game today to play. And one has to be very flexible in terms of how you accommodate the various um, things that might um, make your system unavailable. And today, we really don't do such a great job of this. Uh, this, this is a little old, but uh, Black Friday is the busiest shopping day in the United States. Falls right after Thanksgiving, and everyone goes out to do their Christmas shopping. Walmart is the largest um, department store chain in the United States. And on Black Friday, Walmart came out with, we're down for scheduled maintenance on the busiest shopping day. Well, clearly, that was not an intended business decision, uh, but their system couldn't handle the load. And Amazon and many other companies have been disrupted by high loads um, and various other problems. It's also extremely expensive. We can't ignore uh, the cost of downtime. Again, this is old data, but it shows that in many, many uh, domains, um, you lose millions of dollars for every hour of downtime. So how do we deal with this today? What's the traditional uh, way of handling uh, problems like this to pr in introduce resilience? Resilience, of course, the English word for flexibility in the face of uh, attack or pressure. So uh, you're resilient if when someone hits you, you still stand up. Um, uh, and you're able to uh, accommodate the various influences from the environment. Um, so today, one way is to build it directly into the software. Uh, so we can be clever at programming. We can uh, look for exceptions. We can have timeouts. We can 
uh, be observing the inputs and outputs um, locally in terms of our code and trying to determine when there's a problem. Um, and this is good in some ways because it's right there close to the implementation. You can build it into the system. You know it's there. Um, but for many reasons, it's not so good. Um, it, first of all, when you have an exception or a timeout at the local level, you may have no idea what caused that problem. A timeout, for example, could have been caused by many, many things. A server's down, a network's down, a load balancer is down, a denial of server attack is happening. Many, many possible causes for uh, a performance problem. How do you know what's the right one? It's also not very good at anticipating future problems. Something may not be broken now, but it may be broken in the future, and you don't know that because you have no way to understand what are the trends in the system. They also don't detect softer anomalies. For example, uh, it may be that your system um, responds, but it responds with higher latency than you would like. Um, it's also very hard to maintain and modify. If the, if the uh, protect in protection code is scattered throughout your implementation and you decide to change how you're going to respond to some uh, kind of event or state, um, you have to often go many, many places to, to change that. Um, <clears throat> it's also not so good if you're changing your policies. For example, it may be that at certain times of the day, middle of the night, uh, you don't care if the performance isn't so great, but during peak hours, you want it to be very good. So you have policies that may actually change from minute to minute. And finally, if you have uh, an existing system and you want to make it uh, more resilient, uh, it's very difficult because now you have to go and modify the system itself. The other technique um, that we use traditionally is human oversight. We have operators, we have people monitoring the system, and they are responsible for detecting when there are problems um, and then doing the, the right thing. Well, humans are, of course, are very good at the big picture. They often can sort of see what the problem is. They may observe trends, uh, and so in some ways they are the opposite of the low-level automated mechanisms because um, they um, are good at many things, but they're not very good at speed. So humans are often slow, and they often make lots of mistakes um, when they're doing their operations. Uh, there's a lot of data on the um, ways that systems are affected by human error. Indeed, in many cases, 40% of all system um, outage is caused by operator error. There was an article that came out uh, just three days ago uh, in the Washington Post, and the title of the article was, Stop Worrying About Mastermind Hackers, Start Worrying About the IT Guy. And they claimed that many of the problems that are causing difficulties in our systems are lack of proper administration, the inability to install updates and upgrades and patches correctly, coming about from the complexity of those systems and the difficulty that humans have to understand um, what they should do. And they were talking largely about systems like Oracle, which are incredibly complicated and have many, many updates over time, uh, but they also claim this applies to other systems. Okay, so what do we do? The idea that I want to propose is actually a very simple one, but not so easy to uh, do in practice. The idea, is very simply, is to say, let's move from open loop to closed loop systems. The fundamental concept is we'll have some system that we wish to deploy. In addition, we'll also deploy um, another monitoring system that's responsible for observing the initial system, detecting problems, and then adapting the system um, if it sees something that's wrong and it knows how to fix it. So built into the system architecture, uh, does my pointer work? Eh, not really, okay. Built into the system architecture uh, is the concept of a control layer that's deployed um, externally, but together with the system. Now the question is, well, how do you do this? Um, how do you actually make this work and how can you uh, make sure that the control is doing the right thing? Now this concept of 
of self-monitoring and self-adapting systems um, was proposed many years ago by a number of people, perhaps the most uh, visible and publicly, um, I don't know, publicly visible uh, uh, instance of this was at IBM, where they proposed something called uh, autonomic computing and uh, and specifically the so-called MAPE-K loop, MAPE-K loop. Uh, so MAPE-K means uh, monitor, analyze, plan, and execute. The K is knowledge that the various parts use. And essentially, it breaks down the, the control process into a series of steps uh, that must go on from detecting problems to determining what to do about them to actually taking action. Now, this is actually not such a new idea. And in fact, if you look at many systems today that have high availability, you find that almost by necessity, they have something like this already. Uh, this is an example of the Google file system. It's the uh, architecture that was described in a paper by the developers of that. Uh, Google probably doesn't do it quite like this at the moment. But uh, nonetheless, it's interesting to look at this design um, as an instance of what I was just talking about. In particular, um, Google has many, many um, um, servers and disks uh, using fairly low-end hardware and software that uh, will fail. So it's built into the system to the very design that servers will fail, and you have to be able to handle those. Uh, this component that I've circled in red is responsible for monitoring the health of the servers and adapting the entire set to accommodate failures, specifically taking information from a failed server and making sure it's replicated at least three times throughout the system. So this is a very specific instance, carefully engineered uh, for that particular problem of server failure within Google. But more generally, um, of course, there are some smart people at Google who thought very hard about how to do that, uh, bring reliability to that kind of system. But for other people um, and other kinds of concerns, there may be um, uh, this particular solution may not be exactly the right one. And so there becomes a challenge here um, from a software engineering perspective. How do we make this more generally available and cost effective for everyone, every programmer, to build systems with this capability? And so if we're going to do that, uh, we need to be able to add it to legacy systems. We need low development cost of the control layer. We need to make it uh, specific to our domain. So if we're in a particular domain where, let's say, security is particularly important, uh, then we might focus much of our self-adaptation on security. On the other hand, performance or availability may be more important. We need to be able to, to uh, support multiple quality dimensions so not just performance, or not just availability, uh, but both. Or both of those and um, security as well. We need to be able to change them quickly. And ideally, we need to be able to have confidence that our control layer is not going to do something stupid. That it will actually make the system better, not worse. There are many disciplines that can be brought together here uh, to help solve this problem. I'll mention some of them where I know that research is going on uh, today. Uh, control systems, clearly. Uh, the world of physical control has built up a long history of, of formal approaches to analyzing control systems. Um, unfortunately, uh, well, with many good concepts, such as um, um, settling time. How long does it take when you make a change for it to become uh, um, visible? Overshoot. If you do too much, how much do you overcompensate? Um, stability. Do you oscillate? So those kinds of questions are relevant here, and we can learn from that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have differential equations to help us uh, do the an analysis. So we need to find other ways to, other models to, to think about um, the control. Uh, fault tolerance is clearly relevant here, because many techniques we may use, for example, taking advantage of redundancy um, um, are going to be useful in this context also. Software architecture, we need to design our systems so that they can be monitored and changed at runtime. That typically requires 
some um, design considerations or design uh, attention uh, early. Artificial intelligence, uh, for example, machine learning and planning technology uh, in order to uh, determine the various states of the system, for example, to do anomaly detection um, and to learn over time what works in terms of repair. The human immune system and biological systems in general um, are important sources of in inspiration because they're very flexible, very adaptable, and we can uh, uh, observe those to see if there are lessons from there. Um, I'm going to talk in this, the rest of this talk about the role of software architecture um, in this overall process here, uh, because that's where my uh, expertise is. I am formerly you know, a software architect, and this is the area that I've done research in, so it's the hammer I have to hit this problem. All right, so the system we built is called Rainbow. Rainbow is a framework, which means it's instantiated, that allows you to add this control layer to existing systems. The key concept inside of Rainbow is the idea of an architecture model updated at runtime. An architecture model of the system updated at runtime. Now, all the parts of Rainbow can be tailored to particular domains uh, through extension points that allow you to uh, determine what kinds of probes or sensors I have, uh, what kinds of actuation or operations I can perform on the system, uh, what kinds of models I will use in the control layer, and so on. And once you have Rainbow, then you can instantiate it uh, for your domain at very low cost. So let me uh, just illustrate this a little more um, in a detailed way. Uh, so the basic idea here is we have a system layer and a control layer. Um, there's a target system here that we would like to make self-adaptive. And so the idea here is we need to build uh, some control mechanism uh, that will do monitoring and repair. Well, to do that, of course, we're going to need some help from the system. We're going to need some way to monitor what's there. Uh, it can be low-level information, uh, the sort of thing you get today very easily, you know, loads on servers, information about your network, uh, things like that. And what we'll need to do is to, well, we'll get to that in a minute. We also need a, um, a way to affect the system, to change it. Again, many of these things are built in today's systems. For example, rebooting a server uh, becomes feasible if you have stateless services uh, in your system. So today, we do engineer systems where uh, certain kinds of changes are possible. We could do a much better job of that if we thought about it early, but, uh, but even today, um, it's quite possible to change a system at runtime. Unfortunately, the system level is too low level uh, for doing control, and we need to find a way to abstract the, um, the information to a higher level and be able to use it. And so we have a translation infrastructure that does that. Inside the control layer, there's a model manager, and the model manager is responsible for updating the model of the system for understanding its current state at a high level. So it may, for example, keep track of the average latency of requests. Um, or um, perhaps uh, whether the service level agreements are being satisfied at the moment. So it's a way to observe what's happening in the system. And then we have an adaptation manager that's responsible for detecting problems and fixing them. Now, the actual system itself is a somewhat more complex, and um, the little points on the outside here represent um, uh, plug-in points where you can configure the system uh, for your particular uh, kind of system and particular domain and particular uh, policies and mechanisms that you want to use. So I won't have time to go into this in detail. Uh, there are references at the end. But let me give you a quick example. Uh, imagine you have something like a news service that you're providing uh, through some kind of browser um, that will access servers, web servers, um, that also from time to time may need to go to databases to fetch content. Um, in that kind of world, let's imagine that, that we care about a number of things. We care about um, the uh, availability of the system. We want to make sure uh, that, student, that uh, clients um, can access it, but also um, that the performance is good. For example, that a certain, 
the documents are retrieved within a certain threshold. We may also care about the cost of deployment. How many servers do we have to have out there? Um, finally, we may care about the quality of the data humans are, uh, the clients are getting. Um, in many cases, for example, we have the option of giving um, news service without the pictures if we need to um, have higher performance on our servers or uh, deal with more requests, we can go to a low fidelity uh, form. All right, so if we have the system, there are various things we might monitor. Uh, the response time, let's say, end to end, um, as observed through a load balancer. The latency um, of various web servers. We can look at loads on servers and so on. Um, there are a set of actions that we might deploy here, for example, adding new servers, removing servers. We can raise and lower the quality or fidelity of the uh, content. Uh, we, can we can reboot or restart the load balancer, and so on. So there are a set of actions we can take, and we'll call those tactics. Tactics, they're like the operations that are available to us. Um, and then there's some conditions we care about. So one kind of condition might be that the client request response time, or, or latency, must fall within a threshold. That is to say, uh, some number of seconds. On average, we want the request to come back to, to clients. OK, so this is how it works in Rainbow. Um, the first thing is we have a model of the system that's updated at runtime uh, with various uh, properties that we're monitoring. Um, that we get from the system, and then we translate through the translation layer into model changes. We have some condition. This is in the architecture evaluator here that's looking for problems. In this case, a fairly simple predicate uh, or condition will tell us. We have the ability to affect the uh, system, which is implemented in terms of various scripts. And we're going to have some decision logic uh, that helps us decide what to do when we see a problem. So let me talk about the decision logic and how that works. Um, in the Rainbow system, we our first attempt uh, to build the system was to say, let's go to operators, administrators, understand what they do, and then automate that. We may not be able to automate everything, but many of the routine, common uh, things that operators do, we can put into our system. Uh, and offload that into to the uh, control layer. And so we looked very carefully at what administrators do, how do they think, and we ended up with a language uh, for describing repair. But each form of repair is called a strategy. A strategy is going to be a, a per perhaps a sequence of operations uh, with some conditions. And the conditions will allow you, in the middle of your uh, strategy, to decide if what you did already was successful. So for instance, you may try rebooting the load balancer. If it turns out that that didn't fix the problem, then maybe you try something else. So the idea of a strategy, it's a decision tree that uh, supports the uh, ability to uh, change the system and see what the effects were. Now each of the changes, uh, each of the operations on the system is called a tactic. So. Um, Often, in many cases, you'll find that there may be, may be many strategies that can be applied. I could add more resources. I could reduce fidelity. I could reduce the number of clients. All of those will respond to a, uh, um, a load problem. And uh, the question is, which one do we pick? Well, uh, the, built into the reasoning mechanism is a way to talk about uh, utility. And this is something that it depends on the business context as a user of Rainbow, I'm able to say, if I have to trade off performance for availability, how do I balance that? How important is it for me to give the user or the client good performance versus good fidelity versus cost? So it looks like this. Each of the strategies is a tree. Uh, in order to support analysis, um, well, the, the tree, as I said, um, has a kind of control system model and then after every action, there's a, um, there's a uh, condition that you evaluate which determines which branch of the tree you take next. Uh, this is all done in an uncertain world. When you do an operation on the system, uh, it's done asynchronously, and you don't know for sure whether that operation will 
succeed or not. So there's some um, conditional uh, probabilities that, that uh, you can associate with the branches. Um, there's a notion of asynchrony in the sense that when I make an operation on the system, I may have to wait to see the effects. There may be some delay, um, for example, to bring up a new virtual machine or a new server, uh, it takes minutes. Uh, other kinds of changes can happen very quickly, like changing the fidelity on the servers. And so we need to be able to uh, reason about how long it will take. And then, as I said, there's a notion of a value system which says in the various quality dimensions, performance, availability, security, and so on, um, how do I balance those? Okay, so what we do is for every strategy at runtime, in the current context, we evaluate the utility of the strategy, and this is a, a formal a formula that you can calculate, um, and that will tell you which is the best strategy in that situation. Um, I don't have time to go to, into this in detail about how we do it, but as I said, it's a formula. All right, so how does it work? Uh, we originally tried this in the context of systems like the one I showed you. We call that ZNN.com, which is similar to CNN.com, only we built it. Uh, and um, for things like performance and availability, um, um, we found that, yes, the system can compensate for high loads in the control run there, um, you continue to have worse and worse latency. The desired threshold is a dotted line here. Um, and you can see in the rainbow runs, um, first of all, it takes a little while for it to notice there's a problem. So you have some high latency here. Uh, but uh, at some point, it settles down and you get um, uh, the system within the bounds that you hoped for. Okay, so um, so that was our experience. We also went back to system administrators to see uh, if we could express their operational knowledge in our language and put it into Rainbow. And we did some paper studies on that uh, to convince ourselves and publish papers about the fact that there was a very good match between uh, our language and how they think. So let me just give you um, a little example here of some um, uh, applications here. So more recently, we've been looking um, at security as a kind of opportunity for this technology. Um, in particular, uh, because we've had a, f a performance uh, kind of, of focus before, um, we're going to look at uh, denial service attacks and look at systems similar to the one I showed you as an example. Now, in this world, there are various kinds of qualities that we may care about. If you talk to a security expert, often uh, you'll get the uh, opinion from them that security is the only thing that matters. But in fact, we know that's not the case. Uh, security um, needs to be balanced against performance and cost and other kinds of, of uh, dimensions. And we'll hopefully have a chance to talk more about that at the panel coming up uh, following this talk. Uh, but here are some of the qualities that may be relevant Performance, obviously. Um, if your security gets in the way of performance, then um, that may not be a, a good thing. A cost, you know, how much uh, resources do you need? Uh, maliciousness, that is to say, you may want to get rid of the bad guys. You may decide that this is an important uh, goal of your system is to shut out uh, bad uh, clients. And annoyance, many of the things you do in security uh, have the potential to annoy clients. You might ask them to re-authenticate, for example, um, or prove that they're a human being. And uh, people don't like to do that, uh, so you have to balance the, that factor with uh, the security uh, goals. OK, what are the tactics? Well, there are a variety of things you can do um, at runtime. You can um, add capacity. Remember, we're talking about denial of service. And so for some kinds of companies, um, Adding capacity is, is a perfectly good solution. You just throw resources at it. Uh, Amazon would be a good example where they just don't bother with most denial of service attacks because they have so much uh, spare capacity that they can handle that. Uh, black hole, you can discover which clients are violating their uh, agreements and put them in a black hole. You can reduce service um, to other clients in order to compensate for the load. You can limit the rate of requests. 
you can uh, force the clients or the bad clients to uh, prove that they are humans, for example, with CAPTCHA technology, um, or in the extreme, you can force clients to re-authenticate. So these are some of the things you can do at runtime to affect the security of the system with respect to denial of service. If we put these together into uh, various combinations, uh, we can explore different strategies. So one strategy what might be outgun or absorb. Okay, This is the Amazon kind of case where we have so many resources that we can put into the system uh, that we simply don't worry about keeping the bad guys out. Uh, eliminate would be the opposite. This is where we maybe are a smaller organization and uh, we don't have the spare capacity. We need to discover who's attacking us and, and shut them out of the system. Our challenge, which is we're going to uh, uh, spend some time deciding for various clients whether they're human or not and whether they are who they say they are. So those are three very distinct challenges that will be appropriate in different contexts. Now let me mention that many security uh, systems will pick one of those. will pick one of those and say, this is the right way to do it. The nice thing about this approach is that you have multiple ways that you might affect this. And those could even change dynamically. There may be some times when you want to use one strategy and other times when you want to use another. So this gives tremendous flexibility in terms of, of creating the appropriate strategy uh, for security in your organization. Uh, this is a little more detail, uh, just to show you it's real. Um, so the results of this were that we've applied this and we're doing it in other security contexts now. Um, and the, something I don't have time to talk about, but the language for expressing strategies is a formal language, and you can put it into tools like model checkers and run simulations. You can do analysis. Uh, you can get uh, some insight uh, into the effect of those strategies within different environments. And so uh, you have the capability of doing analysis of your adaptation. Let me uh, mention some of the other interesting uh, work that we're doing, and I'll have to be somewhat brief about this, but I think some of this is very interesting uh, that it goes along with the strategies. So there are many challenges here uh, that people are working on. I want to talk about uh, diagnosis and localization. Okay, with respect to the MAPE K loop, um, it's this part of the loop where uh, we're going to be monitoring and analyzing the monitored information to determine whether uh, there's a problem or not. Okay, so this um, is an issue because we need to know when there are problems, and even better, we'd like to know where the problem is. And given the information, low-level information we're getting, how do we know out of all that information what's going on? Is there a serious problem, a minor problem, and if there's a problem, uh, which components are f causing the problem? This is hard. It's hard uh, because if you see some effect, let's say performance goes down, um, what is the cause? It could be many possible explanations. Um, we often don't have complete knowledge of the system. We can only observe certain things. So in many cases, we're guessing uh, what might be happening. Um, we have to do this in the context of concurrency. So there are going to be many executions happening simultaneously. How do we know which executions are working and which ones are not? The problems may be intermittent. That is to say, a server may go down, but more likely, or sometimes, it will go down and up. Um, and uh, so the problem is here now, but gone later. It may involve combinations. So you only have a problem when this server is talking to this database. Okay, so it's not every database or every server. It's only one particular interaction. And all this must be done in real time. So we have to be able to do this quickly so we can respond to it. So that makes this hard. This is a hard problem. And it's one of the key problems if you want to use this approach, the adaptive systems approach. Because if you can't detect problems, well, then it doesn't work at all. So we have a system to do this. It's a five-step pipeline uh, in which we take monitored uh, events at the low level here. Um, we raise them up in the way that I mentioned earlier. And we have an oracle that for, well, we separate the events into transactions, which represent a exec finite execution path. And then we evaluate each transaction to see if it succeeded or failed. And then finally, we analyze 
a set of those to determine the cause. So let me break that down a little bit. Suppose we have a system here of clients and uh, servers. Um, we have many possible executions going on in that system at any given time. Um, what we need to do is, first of all, define what are the computations, the end-to-end -end computations that, that are going on. And so we can define that uh, using a behavior, a description language like sequence charts or state machines. So imagine that we've defined these uh, um, execution paths, uh, and each one represents a family of possible executions. Uh, we also, at the same time, define um, a criterion for success. So we might say, for this particular end-to-end uh, -end, uh, query, the success criteria is that the response request time is under two and a half seconds. Okay, um, and then what we do is we uh, map the low-level events to higher ones, uh, what we call transactions. So let's imagine uh, this is our system here, and let's suppose that this is one of the uh, executions that goes on. Um, what we do is we fill out a table. So we've numbered each of the components, one through 10, and in this particular run, uh, through our um, abstraction process, we say that we have this execution, and components one, four, seven, and nine were involved. The next run, um, we went a different path here, and we have a different set of components in some, some ways. Uh, we also keep track of whether it succeeded or failed uh, based on the criterion that we specify with this kind of, of behavior, and so on. Um, we build up a table like this. And so we end up, over time, with a table of observations about the system. And then what we need to do is analyze that table and figure out um, what, can, what is causing these problems. Well, it turns out there's a very nice theory that's been worked out uh, in the testing world uh, for fault localization. And so you run tests on systems and you try to decide which part of the code is broken in order to account for the results. And those algorithms, sometimes called spectrum-based fault localization, um, are actually very efficient and uh, very effective at identifying the cause. So what it will do is it will rank, it'll give you the possible explanations for the problem and it will rank those by likelihood. So it'll say, this is the most likely cause of your problem, here's the next most likely, and so on. So that falls out from this other work of that. We decided to investigate this um, using a Samsung case study of a large-scale manufacturing plant uh, where they have thousands and thousands of events per second and um, have very difficult time for operators to figure out uh, when there's a problem, where is the problem? And so we worked with them to develop that. Uh, the system, which here in our simulator shows what it looks like. The protocols that we're checking are much, much more complicated, and the numbers of events that we're handling are on the order of about 3,000 per second. So we wanted to see if we could do that and if we could effectively find problems. Um, of course, Samsung didn't let us put this on their real systems, but we used uh, simulation test beds uh, to ev evaluate that, and, it, and the results were, were um, quite good. Um, all of the diagnosis was done within 20 seconds, which compares very favorably to the hours and hours it takes operators to, to, to do this kind of thing. The rankings were uh, high quality, and uh, uh, we were able to handle high volume. OK, well, there's some other interesting work here that I could talk about, but we're just about out of time. Uh, humans in the loop is a very interesting uh, problem because, in general, we don't have only automated or only human, we have a combination. And how do you put them together? So I won't have time to talk about that, um, unfortunately, but uh, you could read my papers. So let me conclude here. Um, the uh, system that I've talked about, uh, Rainbow, is an instance of what I think is a pattern or if you will, um, an architecture for modern systems where we build in self-adaptation. And the adaptation control layer is able to monitor, uh, detect problems, and then uh, change the system. There's a lot of research going on in this now. I think much of it um, is going to have a very strong impact on, on practice and can even be used today. Uh, but there's still a lot of, of, of interesting problems to work on. Uh, if you're a researcher like me, uh, you can stay in business for a long time uh, working in this area. 
Um, I have, I don't know if these slides will be available, but there are a number of references here. If, if, if they're not, uh, you can go to my website. You'll find a complete list of, of publications about this work, um, including the Samsung case study and other sort of industrial applications um, of the technology. So I will stop with that. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? You use a prob probabilistic decision tree uh, in your system uh, that implies that uh, conditions requiring non-deterministic reactions exist. Uh, could you please give us uh, examples of such conditions that require non-deterministic reactions? Okay. Hello? Yeah. Um, so the non-determinism ar arises in a couple places. Um, one is that the outcome of the previous action uh, may not be completely predictable. And so let's say I reboot a server hoping that will improve the performance of the system. It may or may not achieve the effect. And so there's a, um, an, an uncertainty in the outcome of tactics. The second kind of uncertainty has to do with the, um, um, <clears throat> the fact that there may be several tactics that apply at a given moment, and we have to pick one. And so we're going to pick different branches. So if, if several tactics are applicable, available at that time, we may have to pick those. So there's some uncertainty in the system in terms of which one we pick. Um, those kinds of uncertainty uncertainty are actually mapped into um, a, uh, a Markov decision process uh, model that we can use with tools like PRISM uh, to do evaluation. And in fact, one of the most imp interesting tools are what are called stochastic multiplayer games, where you can run your system against a simulated environment who has a very different strategy than yours. Your environment strategy may be to take your system down, and your strategy is to uh, keep it up, and you can run your um, you can run your models against those those scenarios. So there's a lot of tools now that uh, can allow you to encode that um, uncertainty. Unlike the previous question, which was technical, mine is going to be somewhat philosophical. Uh, in the first worked out example you gave us, uh, ZNN or should I say ZNN, you started with observing what human operators would do and right. trying to emulate that. Right. Uh, in the Samsung example, it was similar. You mentioned that human operators were having hard times, so you tried to do a similar thing but faster. You yourself mentioned that humans were slow and error prone. Yeah. And the fact they succeed to some extent strongly suggests that they select consciously or subconsciously strategies that work even when executed by slow and error prone agents such as us humans. Mm -hmm. But then your control system, your adaptive system, doesn't particularly have to be slow or error prone. Right. Uh, would it not make sense to try something which is totally different from what us humans would do and start with the first principles and approach it in a totally different way? Um, good point. Just to, to rephrase the question so everyone heard it. Uh, we, we observed that we were trying to encode human behavior in our uh, current strategies. And the point was, well, uh, you have the opportunity to do different things than humans because you can go much faster. Uh, that's a very good point. And in fact, right now, um, we're trying to complement the strategies that are fixed that we got from the operator with more active planning technology so that we're able to generate things at runtime by uh, looking to see which tactics we might opportunistically apply. And that can be done very fast. Planning technology is very, very quick. And so, uh, in fact, we often discover other strategies that we didn't get from the human uh, by doing that. So the answer is yes. Um, it's a good idea. Uh, thank you very much. We are out of time. And uh, now we have a um, panel discussion with moderator Georgi Sharkov, and I'm passing the microphone to him.